Are we headed towards a global war? Uh, it sure seems that way. Over the past few months, American forces have been attacked hundreds of times. Uh, why? Has anyone stopped to ask the question as to why? Why are they there in the first place? And over the last few days, of course, three American soldiers were killed in the country of Jordan. Here are those three soldiers. Let's put them up here on the screen. Remember their names and show you their faces. This is Sergeant William Jerome Rivers, 46 years old. Specialist Kennedy Ladon Sanders, 24 years old. Specialist Brianna Alexander Moffat, 23 years old. Why? Why were they killed? So immediately the U.S. government bent over backwards to blame Iran for these attacks. Iran vehemently denies any involvement in these attacks. And even the U.S. Pentagon, when pressed on this, on the specifics of it, was forced to admit that they have no proof Iran was involved at all. Watch. Idris. Just to follow up, you said Iran was behind the attack. So what does that mean? Have you seen evidence of financing or directing anything specific to this attack, not just generally, but specifically? Uh, so maybe I need to clarify further um, from what Lita had mentioned. We know that Iran funds these groups, like Kitab Hezbollah. We know that these IRGC-backed militias are the ones responsible for attacks on our troops in Iraq and Syria. Uh, beyond that, we're, we're doing an intelligence assessment. We don't have, I, don't, I can't give you today that attack thinking it to Iran. We just know that Iran funds these groups like Qatar Hezbollah and other groups that have attacked our forces, but I don't have more to share on general matter, that. You're saying, right? As a general matter, yes. Uh, Let's bring in Colonel Douglas McGregor. Colonel, I just want to first of all get your response, your reaction to what's been happening over the past few hours. The Pentagon admitting, well, we have no proof that Iran was tied to this specific incident, but you know, they've got a, uh, they've got a history, so of course they're probably related to it, and therefore we need to launch and hit 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 them hard the president we don't want to get out in front of what the president is going to do but the president clearly is going to attack iran in some capacity we just don't know what exactly what it will be and iran saying we have no involvement in it so just give me your reaction first of all to that back and forth well facts have never really mattered uh, in washington if washington wants to do something they're going to do it and we need to keep in mind that that certainly over the last 20 years there's been a concerted effort to bring on war with Iran. I mean, this is nothing new. Uh, Iran has been depicted as evil incarnate, as responsible for everything that's bad in the region. And since it is viewed as Israel's not only, but principal opponent, Israel's agents in the United States, the lobby, uh, have pressed very, very hard for a very long time. Your viewers will recall that enormous amounts of money were poured into the Trump campaign in 2016 by very wealthy figures like Adelson. Uh, he had, I think at the time, supposedly dual citizenship, Israeli and American. And he was desperate for a war with Iran. That's one of the reasons that Bolton was assigned to the White House uh, National Security Council, and he was the NSA. So this is nothing new. Uh, what is new is that now we have Biden dealing with uh, the facts, and the facts are that Iran was not involved. And we've we've heard this sort of thing before. Remember, the initial response was that what Hamas did was on orders from Tehran. Well, there was no evidence for that either. These are Arab organizations. The people dying in Gaza are Arabs. They're not Iranians. And there is a, a tremendous difference between what we call Iran or Persia and the Arab states. That doesn't mean that the Iranians are disinterested in what happens to the Arabs there, but they, they have gone out of their way now for years to avoid provoking us. Uh, they, they could have done so in many, many different ways, but they haven't done it. You, you'll recall there was a, an attempt to punish us for the Soleimani uh, assassination, but when the missiles were ultimately launched, all of them mysteriously missed their targets. And we were informed before the missiles were launched that they were being launched. And this is very simple. The Iranians didn't want to kill anybody. And we know from just two weeks ago, when they do launch missiles and they decide to target you, they hit you. They struck with great precision and, and violence targets in Syria and Iraq just recently. You know, they killed the Mossad agent who was a Kurd and his family in his house a very short distance from the American embassy and everyone was shocked. Well, there was no damage to the American embassy. That's because their missile technology is superb and precise and the warheads are devastating. So the point is, no, if Iran wanted to do something, they'd have done it. What we really think happened increasingly is that the target was our base at Al-Tanf, 
which is very large and has been there for a long time, to interdict anything going to Syria from Iran. In other words, via the Shiite Arab areas of Iraq. Well, that that appears to have been the target, but what happens is that this device, whether it was a missile, a tactical ballistic missile, a cruise missile, certainly something larger than a so-called drone, because drones don't carry warheads that wound 35 people and kill three. It just doesn't work that way. Uh, it was an accident. In other words, they, they missed their target. Well, that tells me that these are Shiite Arabs, militias. Why? Because they don't have the most modern technology that Iran has. So you're watching Arabs in Yemen, Arabs in South Lebanon, Arabs in Iraq, Arabs everywhere to the extent that they can, striking at the Israelis because of Gaza. That's all. That's what this is about. And we're trying to turn it into something else and, and create a casus belli for a war with Iran. Gosh, that's been happening repeatedly. The only thing that stopped it the last time in 2019 was that Donald Trump said no. He was ambushed. He was ambushed by the CENTCOM commander, by Pompeo in the State Department, and Bolton, who was a national security advisor, presented with a fait accompli. They already had the strike packages identified and set up. This is our big moment. We're going to attack Iran. And Donald Trump said no. He said, first of all, they shot down an unmanned aerial vehicle, in other words, a global hawk. And that was riding right along the edge of the air, air defense identification zone, what we call the ADIS. And under international law, if you put a military ISR aircraft right along the edge of the ADIS, we have an ADIS, everybody does, everybody has an air uh, identification zone, then under the international law, the country that is under surveillance has the right to shoot it down unless you've informed that country that you are not a threat. Well, we didn't do that. It was a setup. There was the, People knew that the Iranians would shoot this down, which they had every right to do. And then Donald Trump said, well, how many people are we going to kill as a result of this strike? And they said, well, it could be 500, could be 800. And of course, he said, well, they didn't kill any Americans. This was unmanned. And finally, the key question was, well, what happens after the strike? Well, you get a war with Iran. And, right. you know, and he said, well, I'm not sure we want that. That's not a good idea. So he avoided the apocalypse, okay, as far as Iran is concerned and we're concerned. Well, now we have this man, Biden. He's an altogether different personality. And I think in his own deranged mind, he is a playing field marshal. And he's got everybody presenting him with all these options. And you have this chorus of people on the Hill. You have enormous numbers of wealthy, powerful donors. They're calling the White House. This is our moment. You must strike Iran. Well, if you do, you're going to get a major war. And that's not going to stop anytime soon. But their argument is, oh, no. If you fly B-52s over and do real damage, that will deter Iran. Well, if you believe that, I've got lots of swamp land uh, in Florida for you that I'll be happy to sell you because that's absurd. <laughs> it's, we're not going to deter anything. Right. That's the question. What are we going to deter? Are we, if Iran is not involved in it, they're not responsible for it, then how are we going to deter Iran if they're not responsible for it? The logic doesn't make any sense. And meanwhile, this back and forth, there are American service members being killed here. Now, you you know, it's very interesting. You have these three service members who were killed and was asked President Biden, where are you going to have, is the president going to speak to the families of these service members killed? And that's what I kind of want to bring it back to. It's these are Americans who are all throughout this region at these outposts and these bases in many of these spots illegally. Um, and there's been really no discussion about that part of it at all. And the, the, the framing of it is, how can we protect our American forces? How can we protect our American forces over there? To my mind, it's, well, you bring them home. Exactly. You don't have them there. You don't have them in these illegal outposts. Well, sitting there as cannon fodder. And the Biden administration has admitted, even in a New York Times article just a few days ago, admitting that it's only a matter of time before they're attacked, before they're killed, before they're attacked. So they're sitting ducks. They're being used as cannon fodder here. Well, they've been magnets for attack for a long time, but certainly since the 7th of October, when Israel began its operations in Gaza. And it didn't happen immediately after 7 October. It really ramped up after many days had passed because that's when people realized the Israeli campaign <clears throat> is not a vengeance campaign. It's not simply designed to, quote unquote, restore deterrence. In other words, scare everyone that Israel will come and kill them. 
It was a campaign designed to expel or kill the population in Gaza. And when that sank in, then these attacks began ramping up again by Arab formations that were in solidarity with their brothers in Gaza, in Hamas, and with a the population there, not even so much with Hamas, but with the Arab population. So I think the, the bottom line is this. First of all, the target was an accident. The target was Al Tanf, which is in Syria. They struck this tower, which is a very short distance from the Jordanian border with Syria. We are legally in Jordan. Jordan has given us permission to be there for a variety of different reasons, not the least of which is logistics. We can sustain and supply forces in Iraq and Syria from Jordan. Jordan is a, is a convenient place for us to stay and avoid being de- involved in fighting. But the problem is that, you know, now it's been an accident. They struck these things and people are presenting this as an Iranian plot, an Iranian strategy. I I think this is very much like the Gulf of Tonkin incident. Remember, the Gulf of Tonkin incident really had never occurred. And the fight that we had finally was not what people thought it was. Americans were not killed in great numbers. Nothing was sunk. But we eventually ended up sinking North Vietnamese boats. Well, everyone wanted to go to war in Vietnam. There was no stated objective. The mission was unclear. Nobody figured it out for the entire period that we were there. Well, what is the mission for our forces on the ground in Iraq and Afghanistan? And when I asked that question in the Pentagon, when I was just a senior advisor, I said, what are we doing there? What's the mission? Tell me why we're there. Ultimately, nobody could give me a good reason. But the principal reason for us being there, I was told, was for Israel. And I said, well, what are we doing for Israel? And they they said, well, you know, we're early warning for Israel. I said, well, that's ridiculous because the Israelis know more about what's happening in these countries than we do. They're much better informed. Their intelligence in those areas is better. Well, ultimately, it turns out in retrospect, we hold this small oil facility that belongs to Conoco up in the northeast corner of Syria. And we're pumping the oil out of there. And I guess we're selling it to the Turks who then turn around for a profit and sell it to the Israelis so that the Israelis are getting the oil that they need, you know, surreptitiously via the Turks. By the way, the Turkish population has found this out and is angry as hell because they're violently anti-Israeli. They, if, if Erdogan declared war tomorrow morning on, on Israel, millions of Turks would gleefully march towards Israel to throw them out once and for all. So I don't know how much longer that is going to go on. The, the point is, we don't need to be there. We just need to get out. Our forces on the ground are just targets for no particular reason. By the way, that happened to us in Iraq after we'd been there long enough. We were just targets. We were part of a target array. We were convenient. No one wants to admit that if you get us out, the locals will forget about you because you're not really the target. The only reason we are a target right now is because of our unconditional support for Israel. Now, remember that the Iraqi government has already asked us to leave. They subsequently told us to leave now in very no uncertain terms. And you hear all this disinformation through the New York Times, Wall Street Journal, Washington Post. Well, that's not really what they want us to do. They really want us to stay. That's nonsense. Everybody in the region wants us out. So instead of getting out, which makes sense, and eliminating this tragic possibility, and these people were killed pointlessly in my judgment, the 35 are wounded pointlessly, we're going to let them stay there. And I think we're going to let them stay there because we don't want to admit that there was no purpose to it. Just as we've kept a lot of troops in Iraq because we don't want to admit that we lost. Iraq was a strategic failure. Syria is a strategic failure. Afghanistan is a strategic failure. Nobody wants to admit it. Washington never admits those things. So you're maintaining facades. It's tragic. That's what what it's about. And for the benefit of Israel, I played yesterday or the other day here on our show from 2002, congressional testimony of Benjamin Netanyahu being asked by the United States Congress, um, you know, about what their intentions are, what they want. Of course, Netanyahu wanted the United States to preemptively attack Iraq. 
uh, take out Saddam Hussein. We we did his we did his bidding for him. He also said, by the way, Libya. So we did the bidding for there as well. We took out uh, Muammar Gaddafi in Libya, and then of course the third on his list, the most important, is Iran. Of course, as you mentioned, so. 20 years of, of asking to have us, the United States, actively attack Iran, looking through all manner of false flag attacks, whatever you want. They've thrown every the kitchen sink at this to try to make this happen. Do you think the Biden administration, the, the neocons in Washington, the war machine in Washington is just going to turn around, do an about face and walk away from this plan to attack and to wipe Iran off the map to use Lindsey Graham's assessment? Or are we going to have a war with Iran in some capacity? Well, I was asked that several times last year. Tucker asked me that. Uh, I think it was October, November last year. And I said, we're on the path to war with Iran. I think we are. And sadly, I think we will do this. Re remember that you have a third of the American electorate. That is what I call the bombs away club. If you say we're bombing country X, they'll all cheer. They don't even know what's going on in country X, but they think our greatness as a nation is served by bombing people. It's not, but that's what they think. And remember that Iran is not Iraq. And this is another huge problem. And finally, the Israelis, the thinking ones, and there are many good, solid thinking people at the top of the Israeli Defense Force. Privately, they know we made a mess of the region. It was expected that we would make the region safe for Israel. We didn't. It's been less safe from the moment we entered Iraq. We destabilized it which is what all the Arab leaders told us we would do. Everyone warned us. Even Erdogan warned us, don't go in and make this matter worse. Don't destabilize the place. Stay out. But we went in. So I would argue that over the last 20 years, we've made it more dangerous for Israel than it's ever been. Now we want to talk, while we're talking about attacking Iran, Iran is a major military power. These are not hapless people uh, with sandals and bed sheets and AK-47s and RPGs and a few command detonated mines. They have real military capability. They have a very sophisticated group of Iranians running the military establishment. They're very good at cyber warfare. They have excellent intelligence. They have brilliant missile technology. I mean, I've sat and listened to the Israelis who've given me very good briefings on this very topic. But the solution to that problem is not to poke it. If you poke it, it will launch and they will launch and they can attack all the key positions that we have in the region. Remember, we have roughly 57,000 people on the ground uh, in the region, you know, in Qatar, Kuwait, Iraq, Syria. I mean, we just go down the list. All of those positions can be targeted and with great position attack, a great precision attack. Our air defenses are not very good. They simply aren't. They haven't worked well. Our air defenses that we built for the Saudis could not stop Houthi uh, drones, let alone cruise missiles. So who are we kidding ourselves? If we do this, they're going to attack. They'll hit all those installations. Now, somebody said, well, will they attack Israel? I said, I think that depends on what the Israelis do. If the Israelis say, aha, brilliant opportunity, let's launch in, in support of this uh, American attack, which we strongly support, then I think they'll launch whatever they've got into Israel. And they have enough to basically level Tel Aviv and Haifa. These are long range missiles, 1200 mile range with devastating 2000 pound warheads. They're conventional and they'll do enormous damage. I, I call them blockbusters. They'll level city blocks. I don't see anybody benefiting from this. This has been my problem with everything the Israelis have done from day one. They, I understand what they want. I understand exactly how they feel. There's too much emoting. There's not enough thinking. Well, the military industrial complex will make a lot of money off of this. Well, we don't have enough. We don't have strong air defenses in these regions. So we really need to spend another two hundred billion dollars to shore up our air defenses in the Middle East to protect our American forces, our fifty seven thousand forces that are in this region. So yeah, that's what well, you'll have the war hawks in, the, this, in you Washington you doing. You can't lose sight of something very important, uh, Clayton, that no one brings up. If we get involved in the Middle East this way, we're going to have at least a two front war, maybe a three front war. Obviously, the Russians are not going to watch Iran go under. They will prevent that. They will supply and assist and advise. If push comes to shove, they'll join, but they won't try to join. 
They'll try to stand in the background and provide the Iranians everything they need. The Chinese will do the same. If the Russians get involved, the Chinese may ultimately get involved because they're desperately dependent upon the oil and gas that comes out of the Persian Gulf. They're not the only ones. If uh, the Straits of Hormuz are closed, if the Gate of Tears is closed and the Suez Canal, it's going to be hell to pay economically at home and all over the world. So eventually everybody will get involved and we'll be standing next to Israel, hated, despised, and under attack from everyone. But there's another front we're missing, Mexico. There's a substantial Hezbollah presence in Mexico. There has been for a long time. You also have ISIS chapters, if you will, operating in Mexico. They have reasonably good relations with the cartels. I imagine that out of the 9 million people that have been allowed to enter our country, there are probably several thousand people connected, primarily to Hezbollah and secondly to these ISIS chapters. I would expect real trouble inside the country. I would even expect the possibility that some of these serious weapons that may be in the hands now of the cartels end up being launched by these Hezbollah and ISIS people against us. We, we don't know. But I would bet on the worst case. And what have we done about the border? Nothing. And it won't be anything done by the border because nobody in Washington wants to do anything. There are very few people there that give a damn. The people that care are out there in the United States because they're the ones that are the victims of this whole policy of destruction. So this is bigger than the Middle East. This will come and visit us in the United States. And we have stupid people that think we can bomb with impunity and nothing will happen to us. They are wrong. I hope our audience is paying attention. And I hope you, anyone watching right now, please share this video with people. You know, if we have 30% of the population that is in the bombs away club in the United States that think it's okay to go in and destabilize regions and bomb the hell out of people, uh, please share this video with this, those individuals and listen to what the Colonel uh, is just saying here in front of you all. Colonel, great to see you as always. Thank you for your your amazing insights in this. And I, it was eye-opening to think about this third front, the idea of Mexico, these cartels. Of course, we've been covering this southern border and Hezbollah and the influx of tens of thousands per day into the United States. I hope Americans wake up to this. Colonel, great to see you as always. Thank you so much. Sure. Thanks, Clayton. Bye-bye. I really hope you enjoyed watching this video. You know, YouTube thinks that you'll actually like this next video right here. It's personalized based on your own viewing habits. So if you watch the video, please leave a comment. Let us know what you think about it. And we will see you next time, everyone.